Okay, you guys. Hello. Um, listen, obviously I've had several guests in lots of ways um, here, but I'm very excited about having this man here. I don't know if you guys know this, but Stan Mitchell is the reason I moved to Nashville. I moved here to get to know him better, to learn from him. I've been, so I've listened to a lot of different people in my journey uh, of coming out and becoming, you know, affirming of the LGBTQ plus community, specifically with my theology. Stan has been an incredible influence for me in that way. And so I'm so excited for you to get to hear from him. Uh, we're going to talk about all kinds of things, but people are like, who's Stan Mitchell? I'm like, I wish I could send you to a website or a book or something. And, you know, there are things in the works, but uh, I love that I get to show you guys him now. So I first got exposed to Stan. I was listening to a podcast episode by the liturgists on the LGBTQ plus issue. Um, they had a bunch of different pastors specifically who were facing the same conversation, having different approaches. And that's where I first got exposed to Stan. And his voice was so different from anybody I'd heard up to that point of this conversation. Immediately, I was like, who is this person? The way he approached it, his attitude, his heart posture, his relationship with scripture was so different. And it was inspiring. And I was like, I need to talk to this person. Um, anyway, so through a journey and an adventure, we got connected and We've talked many times and I'm so excited for you guys to get to meet him. So uh, here's Stan Mitchell. I'm going to ask him questions, but I'm hoping that he's going to do all the talking. Also, just FYI, you can say whatever you want to say. You don't need to censor anything. People get to wrestle out, you know, what they want to do with that. Sure. Um, if we get offended, we get to work that out. So feel free to just express yourself and say what you want to say. Go at it however you'd like. So first of all, Stan, why don't you first introduce yourself? Who are you? Where did you come from? What have you been doing? What's your background? Let's start there. Well, I am a... 53-year-old, cisgender, heterosexual, white, <laughs> evangelical, uh, grew up Pentecostal pastor, grew up in Arkansas, five generations deep, both sides of my family there, five generations of Pentecostal, wow. um, came to Nashville in 1995, have stayed here since then, raised my two kids here, have a 16-year-old and a 23-year-old, um, stayed here as a pastor, came here as a pastor, stayed here as a pastor. I, I suppose, um, germane to this conversation, in 2003, I started a church along with a group of friends of mine called Grace Point, and Grace Point was really built as a deconstruction zone for Christians, specifically evangelical Christians who were wrestling with their faith, you know, uh, the questions that everybody's talking about these days uh, around deconstruction. Grace Point was exactly that from 2003 to about 2012. We had a great run. 2012 Marriage Amendment Act came out, and our church chose to begin a period of discernment on what to do about the matter of LGBTQ plus inclusion, full inclusion for the LGBTQ plus, which would include but not be limited to uh, same-gender marriage, performing those ceremonies, the ordination of LGBTQ plus people. So we did that from 2012 to the beginning of 2015. 2015 in January, we made a statement of full inclusion. Um, I continued to pastor there till 2019. I'm now called the founding pastor. We have a new lead pastor. And I essentially, a third of my work now is working with churches that are towing the threshold of that same process. And probably two thirds of my work is working with LGBTQ plus people their family, their friends, specifically those from evangelical or traditional, even Catholic backgrounds who are wrestling with all of this, the emotional, personal side, as well as the very intricately woven theological side. So that's who I am. The work that I do is mostly, this is why you struggle to send people your age to where I am because I'm on Facebook. <laughs> the bulk of my work is with the families of these folk. And so there's a lot of 45 to 70 year old evangelical parents working with this. So that's where I, I do the bulk of my work. That's a really good point. I should just be sending them to your Facebook page. I don't know why. <laughs> that's why I am. Yeah, nice. Okay, so, uh, so many questions, but to start off in that space, whether it's from you personally or you guys as a group, what made you decide to become inclusive? I would just love to open up the, the conversation of what led you to that place. How did you end up getting there? I think I, I have to always mention the fact that inclusion for me, the issue of inclusion for me did not start with LGBTQ plus people. Uh, inclusion for me began a long time before. The best way that I can describe it is I grew up in a very, very, very fundamentalist, exclusivistic denomination. 
a denomination that was so restrictive and inclusive, we did sincerely teach and believe that we were the only Christians. So I, I joke, but it's tongue in cheek, but it's really true that when my people were studying um, comparative world religion, we were studying the Baptist and the Methodist and the <laughs> Assembly of God. We, we, and truly, we, we, we viewed, we didn't think Billy Graham was saved. And so for me as a child growing up in that, I knew not only as a Christian were we the only ones, but I knew that even as a subcategory of Christianity writ large, we were really the only Christians. It was a restorationist group, an aberrant form of Pentecostalism that really felt somewhere around 1915 that we got a few revelations that nobody else had ever had. We did essentially believe that the church had been dormant for 19 centuries between the end of the first century. So it was that kind of a restorationist group. So my first issues were with inclusion, my first heartburn or consternation internally with inclusion was as a 10 and 11 year old boy going to the funerals of aunts and uncles or grandparents who were not, they were not our form of Christian. And not only wrestling with those who died, but wrestling with those who were living, wrestling with these wonderful family members of mine in this little provincial northeast Arkansas town that went to not only church, but even went to Pentecostal type churches. I mean, Assembly of God and Church of God, we didn't even believe those people were saved. And so the dissonance of knowing how wonderful these people were, how sincere they were, and yet reconciling that with the fact that I was taught they were lost was a lot to deal with. Mm -hmm. So that's where my journey with inclusion began. It was fortuitous that my form of Christianity was so extreme. And I say fortuitous, not in every way, but at least in this way, that it started me early thinking about these matters. Mm -hmm. It tenderized me, sensitized me to the reality that really sincere people could believe awful things about other people because they believe awful things about God. And so it wasn't first queer people, it wasn't first Hindus and sincere Muslims or sincere Jews or even sincere Catholics or even sincere Methodist. It was my sincere aunts and uncles that started me on that path. Mm -hmm. And then it transferred to people like Billy Graham and then it jumped the Protestant Catholic divide over to Mother Teresa. So that process wore a path in me Hmm. and made me capable. It created the capacity in me to do this work. So that's where it started for me. For the sake of people hearing about your journey for the first time, you became inclusive. There was backlash. There was fallout. Can you maybe paint the picture a little bit more of like what kind of cost was this for the church, for you, when you made Grace Point fully inclusive? What did that look like? We, we were a, a, a church. We were already kind of a moderate progressive church. So we were a gadfly in the community. We were never going to be on that. A gadfly? Um... A fly in the apothecary's ointment. We were kind of, we were kind of pushing the envelope on things. We were an annoyance. On a good Sunday, we would have 800 people in our congregation. There were probably 2,500 members in the throes of that. Between 2015, as that congregation of 800 slash 2,500, a 1.7 million dollar budget, a 23 acre campus, we got all the way down to a congregation of. 60 to 80 people on a weekend and a few hundred that called themselves members there. We had to sell our campus. We made it through that hardest. That was the low point. We made it through that, got to the other side, and now Grace Point on a Sunday, a good Sunday now, we'll have two to 300 people. The congregation is probably, I would say there's six, 800 people who call it home. And it's a thriving church and doing well. The new lead pastor there is a wonderful guy, wonderful friend of mine. I'm the founding pastor, which is kind of like Queen of England. No <laughs> responsibility, no power, just nice to be there. And they, <laughs> I sit in the back and hand out bulletins and make sure people know who I am. <laughs> Still have a weak ego. We, we survived, but it was hard. Having gone through that, there was, I understand, there was national coverage of this experience or this move. Like, can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? Oh, sure. We were, we were 
an anomaly because evangelical churches in the Bible Belt were not making this decision. There are denominations that had already made this decision. But for an evangelical church in the middle of the Bible Belt to make that decision, we were we were really on the front cusp of that, which is sad that 2015 was how long it took. To that end, it's 2022. There hasn't been like a groundswell following us. I think back in 2015, the few of us who did this, we were like, we're going to like, the, the dam's going to break. It's still a trickle. It's because it's so difficult. It was big news. So, I mean, Wall Street Journal and Time Magazine and CBS, NBC, they were all coming down. Like the national level programs doing interviews. It was kind of amazing. And in retrospect, kind of sad that it would be that big of a news. In the last few years, I've spent a lot of time in the Northwest, like Portland and Seattle working there. Honestly, when evangelical churches or churches of any kind become inclusive on this issue, there's no room for self-congratulation because the rest of the world up there is like, what? (laughs) You mean you're just now getting to this. So it's not something that credibilizes you with the culture around because they're like, there's no room for congratulations here. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm glad you aren't doing that anymore, but geez, (laughs) we didn't even know you still were. So some of the self-congratulations we got in the South, you don't get in other parts of the world for sure. So it was big news, sadly. I know some of my audience probably aren't super apprised of the differences in the denominations. What made the other, like a Methodist or a Presbyterian, not saved in your upbringing? Like what was the differences in some of those areas that you're just like, oh, why is that a deal breaker? Wow, that's, okay, now (laughs) you're really getting into the weeds here. Because there are a lot of different restorationist groups. We all know that a lot of Catholics feel this strongly and built into Catholic doctrine is this kind of sense toward Protestant people, like there's no capacity for them to be saved. That's certainly softening a lot, you know, in a lot of Catholic circles. By and large, that's that's the way it is. We, we know Church of Christ folk also have a tendency within their circles to believe that outside of them, you know, people are, if they're not lost, their salvation is definitely in jeopardy. My little restorationist group was, again, an aberrant form of Pentecostalism. Normal Pentecostalism is Wesleyan in its tradition. The Wesley brothers emphasized that there was a second work of grace that we refer to as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Wesley referred to it not as a tongue-speaking experience, but first as as a strange warming inside of him. It was at the end of the 19th century that some Wesleyan Nazarene people began to explore the book of Acts and say not only should you be strangely warmed but this subsequent work of grace is poured out and you will also speak with tongues glossolalia as an evidence that that spirit baptism has happened the Wesleyan tradition was always that that was a second work of grace that followed salvation my little group did not believe that my group believed that was not two works of grace it was one work of grace so until a person was baptized in the spirit exclusively with the evidence of speaking in tongues, they were lost. If they believed otherwise, even about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it would somehow impugn their baptism. We also believe that water baptism had to be administered by immersion, calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My people also developed what they thought was a new take actually an old take, a first century apostolic take on the Godhead, and we rejected the idea of the Trinity. Our, our, our people were not Trinitarian, they were called Oneness Pentecostals. Anyone who was baptized calling on the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, anyone who had a Trinitarian conception of God, we definitely believed in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We just simply saw those as three modes. We didn't know enough about church history to know that in the second, third, and fourth centuries, there were people that had those same thoughts. They were called modalists. We made big issues out of that. We also made big issues out of external holiness. Our women couldn't cut their hair. Our men had to have short hair. We weren't supposed to have facial hair, at least under the nose. I never understood how we could have eyebrows, but we couldn't have (laughs) mustaches. We made those things necessary. There were not, in our world, there were not primary, secondary, and tertiary issues. There were no ancillary doctrines. The doctrine that a woman couldn't cut her hair or wear slacks was as important as the doctrine of God. There were not levels to those things. So anybody who didn't see it that way didn't have what we were always referring to, and I air quote it not to diminish it, but the the truth. We had the truth. We were the harbingers. We were the last of the Mohicans of Revelation. God had given it to us. We brought back a dormant church for the end time. So you're saying like this would cost me my salvation in that circle. It would at that point. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing these days that facial hairs, the, there's a softening on that. 
My parents in that movement were always pushing the envelope. I have chagrined them by going further than they did. But anytime my dad says, son, why are you doing this? How are you doing this? On what grounds are you doing this? I always say, you, you were pushing the envelope. Mom was on the organ and teaching Sunday school classes. And she did a study on 1 Corinthians 11 and decided that she could cut her hair. Our pastor came to the house, told her he was going to have to take her down. She couldn't play the organ anymore. (laughs) I remember when our pastor came back and told her if she would wear her hair up so the cut ends couldn't be seen, tuck them under so they couldn't be seen, she could play the organ again. I remember her saying that she wouldn't be a hypocrite. Yet you guys stayed in that church from within pushing the envelope. I wasn't supposed to play league sports. Those were considered peewee basketball, peewee football, little league baseball. Those were worldly amusements. My dad coached them. So my dad and mom were always being sanctioned within that movement. They weren't rebels, but they were pushing. It chagrins my dad deeply when I look at him and I say, I learned this from you. You were the one who taught me to sincerely and bravely push the envelope for conscious sake. Sorry, dad, this is your fault. Yeah, you right. did this. You made me this way. I don't mind him watching this because we talk about this. We've talked about deconstruction a few times. I mean, they know that this is something that I value and think is necessary and important for just where we are and what's going on. Can you speak from your rich history and experience? What is your take on this whole deconstruction thing? What is the value here? For people who like hear the word deconstruction and just immediately trigger like, oh, that means you're a heretic. That means you don't believe in Jesus anymore or whatever they just jump conclusions to, which is not true. How would you address just like clarifying what you mean when you say the word deconstruction and what that looked like? Deconstruction first is just a normal psychological process of maturation. We all remember back freshman psychology, the chapter on individuation, differentiation, or weaning, where a child begins to wean from the assumed ideas of their parents. So it's a normal process. We don't just do that religiously. Uh, We do it politically. We do it ideologically and every form, culturally. Deconstruction is not something that's, you know, just relative to our religious spiritual life. It's a part of life always. I'm not a deconstructionist for the sake of deconstruction. I'm kind of a 369 in the Enneagram triad, so a big part of my life is peacemaker and loyalist. There's nothing that I value more or enjoy more than taking apart something that I have assumed, deconstructing it, and then being able to put it back together and say, yeah, I think I still believe that. I I don't just enjoy the parts of my spiritual journey that differentiate me from my parents. I enjoy most the parts that I still share with them. So deconstruction doesn't necessarily mean you're going to end up somewhere else. It just simply means you're going to evaluate and make that assumption yours. And that's just a normal part of life for all of us. Deconstruction is one of those words that is associated with so many things and it's almost becoming cliche now. But I do think it's a normal healthy part of life because I think the stages of our journey, just the psychological maturation of our life, go something like this. We assume and memorize the answers of other people. It's called schematic development. I know as a child, I know this is a thumb and this is a finger. At one point, I think these are all fingers and I think, oh no, no, that's a thumb. It's a finger, but it's also a thumb. That's a wrist. That's an elbow. That's purple. That's blue. That's red. Schema refines. Not only do I know purple and red, but now I know lavender and I know fuchsia and I know pink and I know hot pink and I know periwinkle. Schema Mm -hmm. develops. You look out the window and you say dog but it's actually a cow. The reason you say that is because the first time you saw a four-legged creature, it was called a dog. Schema develops over time. But what you're doing as a child in a very naive, innocent way, a prone way, a vulnerable way, is you're memorizing, you're developing and memorizing other people's answers. Mm -hmm. The second stage of that is when you begin to become aware of what the questions are. You're not so sure that the answers you've memorized, which were other people's answers, line up with the questions. You're not sure they don't, but you'd kind of like to answer the questions yourself. You'd like to resolve them yourself. You begin to find your own answers to life's questions. But I think the the third stage and a necessary stage beyond that is when you begin to realize, "I, I not only memorized other people's answers, But now I'm answering other people's questions. I may have other questions than this. So good spirituality isn't always just assuming the questions of others, but finding your own questions. That's just normal stuff. And I think we we all should be doing that stuff in every area of life. And deconstruction does not necessarily imply that somebody is going to say, 
Yeah, I don't agree with your definition of purple. I mean, I my mom has dementia. One of the great joys of our life where we connect is we sit around and sing old hymns. And we don't feel the same way about, you know, some of the stuff that you and I will be talking about. But there's a lot I still share with her. And I would choose, as someone who's experienced deconstruction, to focus on the beauty of the similitude as much as some of the painful areas that I've had to move on. So that's deconstruction as, as I see it. You mentioned your inclusion of the LGBTQ plus community was not inspired by them. You were already on a process of recognizing there's something wrong with the exclusivity of our mantra and the way we approach scripture or theology or whatever. And so you started expanding more and including other denominations and it just kept going into the point where now you're including the LGBTQ plus community. That probably wasn't an easy assumption or leap. There was work that needed to be done. I don't know what direction you want to go with this, but I'd love to hear just like, how did you go from, oh, maybe the Methodists are in the kingdom as well to <laughs> the Rainbow Crew is also here. How did you do Especially when the establishment is so against that. My deconstruction didn't start with a, a theory or an abstract concept. It didn't start with, uh, you know, a doctrine of baptism. It started with Uncle Bud and Aunt Bernice. It started with human beings. Mm -hmm. Parker Palmer, the great author that I would encourage everyone to read after, Palmer beautifully said, and I won't get this exactly right, but the gist of what he said was, it's amazing that a religion like Christianity, one that is supposedly based on the idea of incarnation, so often gets lost in disembodied concepts. We are incarnational. Even the literary portion of what we consider to be the communication of God. In John 1 said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh. And that fleshly Word, Jesus, didn't then you know, pass the baton to a book. He said to us, you're going to stand in my stead. Specifically, Paul said, now we are the body of Christ. We now stand in the stead of Christ, reconciling the world. The body of Christ is a fleshly body. As I see church history, and I, I don't think it takes a careful reading of church history to see this, most theological development for us has not started in the ivory tower or with a group of people studying tenses of verbs or the syntax of a biblical text. We, we don't generally start with some esoteric theory. We generally start with human experience. That's the incarnational side. I mean, think Think about the early church. I mean, we can go back to the life of Jesus for this, but think about the book of Acts. When Peter saw the rooftop vision, he immediately contradicted that vision and the heavenly voice, assum assumably God's voice. He immediately contradicted that on the grounds of what he thought scripture said. So he was having a, an experience that was dissonant with his understanding of the text. Now, there are two things that you can do there, and both of them are sophomoreish and immature. The one is to allow the experience to override the text and become dismissive toward the text and say, well, it's evidently stupid. The other is to be so wooden-headedly committed to your interpretation of the text. Again, people often ask me, do you believe in the authority of Scripture? I said, well, I may believe in the authority of Scripture, but I don't believe in the authority of your interpretation of Scripture or mine. I mean, the Protestant Reformation has proven scriptural interpretation is so clear. We have 40,000 denominations, 300 <laughs> versions of Baptists for crying out loud. The reality is we don't dismiss the text, but we also don't let our understanding of the text dismiss this experience. So we allow the experience to drive us back to the text with this question. Have we read, have I read this text most faithfully today? through the lens of current experience, context, and information, standing on the shoulders of everyone before me, have we read this text most faithfully? And church history is a long history of human experiences. So the experience I had with Uncle Bud and Uncle Junior and Uncle Bill and Aunt Charlotte and all these good people who were supposedly lost, the experience I had with them, their witness, the beauty of their Christianity, the realness of their experience, it didn't automatically make me throw out the Bible. It did make me humbly question my interpretation of the Bible. And all that happened with LGBTQ people was they became one more group of people. And they really weren't a group of people. They were Antonio and Ron and Larry and Jody and Mary. They were people who I, I witnessed three things in them. I witnessed a very real experience of Christ. I witnessed a very fruitful experience. Christian life that justified their statement of being a follower of Christ. And the third thing, I witnessed their suffering. And I think those experiences, the suffering, the realness of their experience was enough 
to stop me and to drive me back to the text saying, have I read this most faithfully? My reconstruction or new construction, when, when I do deconstruct and the parts aren't lining up, generally the glue that begins or the abstract, the blueprint that begins to put the pieces back together for me is very incarnational. It's the experiences of people. Through that lens, I begin to see scripture new. You were experiencing a lot of this in your process in a position of leadership within the church structure. When you say the third thing you're witnessing about these queer people was their suffering. Do you, are you talking about specifically within the church context? And yes. if so, what did that look like? Could you explain maybe more explicitly the symptoms of their suffering that was strong enough to compel you to revisit this? The worst suffering was watching them question their own relationship with Christ. The suffering of them questioning whether or not they were saved and within our language, whether or not they had a relationship with God, whether or not they were going to spend eternity in heaven or hell based upon this part of them that they couldn't fix. Watching LGBTQ people try to be something they weren't, try to be transformed, try to be straight, knowing and, and watching, not just watching adults do this, but watching 10 and 12 and 14 and 17 year old children doing this and watching them feel like they were less. That's an immense amount of suffering, just that process. The secondary suffering was watching them hold a very second class at best citizenry within the church. You know, we, we were further down the road than a lot, but they were at the communion table, but they really weren't at the communion table. Prepositionally, they were under the communion table. They were the Syrophoenician woman who was told that she doesn't belong at the table, and she said, maybe not, but I'll take what falls from the table. And for starving people, often the crumbs that fall are enough. But like people of color, especially here in uh, the North American experience, people of color coming from chattel slavery, there was a time that the Jim Crow South, separate but equal water fountains, I mean, a water fountain with a sign above it describing your capacity to drink from this fountain and not that one. For a while, maybe that was experienced as better than not having water in the slave fields. But there's a point where the water from a separate but equal water fountain begins to taste bitter and poisonous. I, I watched these people suffer. At first, satisfied to assimilate the inadvertent communion crumbs that fall from the corner of our mouth, the wine-soaked ones. But eventually, they begin to suffer beneath the table. So watch, I watched them suffer as not being able to be in positions of leadership, not being able to have their marriage done in the church, not being able to have you know their child dedicated with them standing in front of the congregation, not being able to be ordained if they felt called to ministry, that kind of suffering. Mm. I mean, I, I didn't assume when I went back to the text that I would read it differently. I can admit that I wanted to. And so that would impugn in some people's mind because now I have an ulterior motive. But my question is, how severely wrong is that ulterior motive? I'm a cisgender heterosexual. My kids are cisgender heterosexual. I didn't, within my immediate family, have a dog in the hunt. I wasn't doing this for me. If I'm impugned by my desire for the text to say something differently, then I'm impugned. I can say in defense of that, though, as much as I wanted the text to say something differently, I didn't assume it would. And I wasn't foolish enough to gerrymander the text to make it say something that it didn't say because I knew ultimately if this was love, that wouldn't be helpful. So I still had that evangelical traditional and still have to some degree, to a great degree, that sensibility of I love scripture, I love tradition, I, I'm not going to change, change this you know, if it, if it doesn't merit changing. I can say, and this is something that's well known in these circles, there, there were six texts. There really are. When you look at the entirety of the Bible, there are six big texts. And people from our side kind of pejoratively call those clobber texts because they feel clobbered by them. But there were six texts that I had to get through. The church had generally assumed these were the texts that speak to this issue and forbid same gender romantic love, to be specific. Once I got back to those texts, texts like Romans 1, 26, 27, once I got back to those texts and began studying them through, I had the same experience that my mom had as a Pentecostal 
organ player at church who went back and studied 1 Corinthians 11 and realized that it wasn't forbidding women in all times and all places to ever trim the dead ends of their hair. I had that same experience with those six texts. The conversation, the hermeneutic, the specifics of interpretation that led me to that, that was a, gosh, Mike, that was a, in earnest, that was a five-year process for me. And remember, that was happening for me back in 2005 to 2010. There's even more and better information now for people to work with. And I think the climate is different. I, it was still very resistant at that point. But I, I did once reading those texts, reading the text about Sodom and Gomorrah, realized this was not a text about same gender committed romantic love between two people who are homosexually oriented. That's not what that text is talking about. Any more than other texts in the Bible that are talking about human sexuality or are always talking specific to 93 different things. Generally, they're in context speaking to something very directly. And you need to be very careful overlaying those things on to issues that they weren't speaking to. So, and you know, the great help for me, Brownson, the, the great theologian from Michigan, his books were very helpful. Books that I recommend now all the time. My strength is not taking people through those texts and showing them what I saw. I can do that. My part in this work is to get them to be willing and to make the decision to go back to the text. Once they go back to the text, they're like, well, do you have a book? No, no, no. Other people have written those books. I'm doing the incarnational work that at least opens them to go back. Once they go back, depending on where they are, I'm recommending Matthew Vines and his great work, which is really good for evangelicals who have a very high view of scripture. David Gushy, the Baptist pastor ethicist, his work is really wonderful. Kathy Baldock, our mutual friend, her work is just par excellent. There are so many resources for people who are willing to go back. What I find is once they go back and do the work, there's a lot of resources there. The hardest work in all of this is getting them to be willing to go back. And I'm trying to build the theological case that not only, not only should they entertain going back, it's a moral, Christian, ethical responsibility based upon incarnational experiences. And there's enough suffering in the body of Christ around this that we at least should be willing to go back. So when people go back and they're in the morass and they're struggling through all of that, I'm very patient with how long that process takes. Why wouldn't I be? It took me eight to 10 years. You know, what am I going to do? Spend eight to 10 concerted years trying to reconcile this and once I do, hold everybody accountable the next day. I'm very patient with those who are in that process and I know they're diligently working through all of that. What I have a hard time having patience for are the stubborn Christians who in the face of all all of this experience, the experience of people like you, look back at me, look at you and say, no, this is a closed issue. It does not deserve revisiting. I think that is very unchristian and inhumane. Man, I love Stan. This is a three-part series I did with him. This interview was one long conversation I'm breaking up into three sessions because he has so much detail and so much depth and like understanding and breadth of knowledge he's bringing to this conversation that I, that I love. I'm so glad that we got to have this conversation and record it. So make sure you check out part two and three of this uh, interview series. He's going to get deeper into what led him to the place of becoming inclusive, how we read scripture, and even learning from Jesus and Paul how to rightly divide the word of truth. So fascinating, so important. I think this is such a big deal for all Christians to hear, especially in the modern church today, how we relate to scripture and then the decisions we make based on our relationship with the text. So I hope you check out the other two uh, parts that are going to come out after this. It's going to get awesome.